Hello, I'm Taya Ryan, the CEO of Georgia Public Broadcasting. And I'm Laura McCarty, President of Georgia Humanities. One of the things that I take great pride in at GPB are the outstanding journalists who provide our viewers and listeners with news, information, and educational programming. They help us understand the complex world we live in. They present the facts, document current events, explore local issues, and act as the society's watchdogs. They add important context, not only to the stories they report, but also to historical and cultural references and the shared human experience. But with a growing array of mainstream and unconventional news sources, social media and blogs, how do we know as consumers that the news we're getting is reliable? How do we recognize the difference between credible and fake news, objectivity or bias, opinion or propaganda? And how do we use that information to help us make reasoned decisions that enrich our lives, our communities, and help bind us as a society? These are some of the questions that we're going to explore in more detail in the next hour. No matter where you get your news, the goal of this program is to help you recognize how to get the best information available as a responsible news consumer so that you can contribute to our democracy as an informed citizen. Starting us off on this discussion is the host of GPB's Morning Edition, Leah Fleming. You can hear Leah greet you each morning on all GPB's 19 radio stations across the state and on gpb.org. Leah? All right, question. Where do you get your news? Is it social media, maybe it's a blog, website, or is it TV or radio? Most likely, it's all of the above. But have you ever wondered how that information is created? And is it reliable? And what is the difference between a journalist and an author of a social media story or some of these conspiracy stories that are often out there? How do you tell the difference between credible journalism versus the content that floods your social media feeds. Well, to answer some of your questions, we're taking you inside a newsroom, so to speak, to see how the sauce is made. Joining us to talk is Ram Ramgopal. He's executive editor in charge of vetting the editorial content that is presented on CNN. All right, Ram. So here's here's the question. For many of us uh, who work in this, in this business, we, um, we often forget that you know, our friends or people that reach out to us, uh, that bring us story ideas, uh, don't really know what happens inside a newsroom, what we do. Mm -hmm. And so my first question for you is, what do you do? Well, um, I am one of the executive editors who is responsible for vetting content, as you described it. Um, I look at things that are particularly those uh, that are controversial, sensitive, um, alleged wrongdoing, things that if we get factually wrong uh, would be an embarrassment uh, to the brand that I represent, or if I you know, if we get it really wrong, uh, that we could face uh, legal consequences. So the job that I handle on a day-to-day -day basis is one of ensuring that everything that we put out is accurate, um, it's balanced, and that it has been vetted to the best of our ability. Um, so that is the nature of the job that I do on a daily basis. Uh, okay. So I... I don't know if this happens to you a lot, but it happens to me all the time. I will he hear from a friend or family member or even someone in the community that's reaching out with an interesting piece of information that they saw on Facebook, a news story or a tweet that had something interesting in it that you have just got to cover. And I know for me, I love getting uh, story ideas from people, word of mouth, that's the best. But I think for a lot of people, they think we're just going to turn around and run with it, and it winds up on the air. But that's just not the case. There is a process for actually uh, looking at that piece of information, vetting it. So, so talk a little bit about that. That happens to you, I'm sure. 
All the time. Yeah. Uh, there are two ways, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, partly, some, sometimes people call us. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people reach out via Twitter. I'm very active on social media, and people reach out and say, you've got to look at this story. Um, sometimes it's our own reporters who have already gotten this story and have spent sometimes weeks, maybe months, maybe years digging into a story. Um, and everything that they gather is not put on the air immediately. Um, if it is something that we get as a way of a tip, um, there are shades of that. Uh, sometimes uh, you may get news of a power outage. Mm. Uh, somebody calls and says, you won't believe just what just happened. We just had a power outage. And, uh, you know, the journalist in you automatically gets the adrenaline going to say, oh, that is news because we've got to get to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a process of vetting this, you know, and figure out, is this widespread? How, how many homes are affected? Is there something else that's going on? Could it have been caused by the weather? Could it have been caused by some sort of unusual event, um, perhaps an attack of some sort? So that, that's when you, it starts to escalate. At every point, you have your guard up because if you think that something is too good to be true, it probably is not true, you know? So it, it may need a lot of vetting, a lot of um, uh, checks to that process. Uh, and when it comes to uh, social media, I would advise, uh, you know, consumers. Uh, I'm a consumer myself mm -hmm. first. Uh, when I see something on the Twitter feed, I pause and I say, is this possible? Does it fit the context? Is there something here that we need to dig into? Is there something that we may be missing? Is there another explanation? And it's only after that that we get to the next stage of whether we should be doing the story. Mm. Uh, and depending on the urgency of that, that could be squeezed into a few seconds. Sometimes it could be several minutes. Sometimes, it, as I said, it could be days or months or years. So each story, I think, needs to be treated with that degree of skepticism, no matter what it is. And that's what I would advise every consumer to be skeptical. Uh, but also know that there are certain brands of news outlets um, that take great care and pride in what they do. The vast majority of uh, news outlets do. So proceed, but with caution, and know what you're consuming has been vetted, but make your own educated guesses. Right. And not everybody that is putting content out there is an actual trained journalist. And that doesn't mean that what they're putting out there doesn't add value. It just means right. that they're not, you know, trained in terms of of uh, what we do and how to do it, because certainly one aspect of the job is sourcing. Right. So uh, I know sometimes, you know, as I'm watching CNN and for a lot of people, they'll hear, uh, you know, one of the hosts talk about uh, my sources, mm -hmm. my sources. Explain a little mm -hmm. bit about that, because there are sources. Exactly. So just because the sources are anonymous, does not mean that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very high bar to get an anonymous source on the on the air, on in print, um, th and that's the case with every reputable news organization. Most news organizations would insist on getting at least two sources of uh, you know to provide the information. So if one source says this is what happened. A second source will need to confirm that. The exceptions to that, as you know, Leah, is when somebody's speaking on the record. You know, mm -hmm. if it's a police uh, commissioner, if it's the uh, if it's the governor of a state speaking on the cam on camera or to in a, at a news conference, you know that's fact, and you're going to say, Governor, you know, John Brown says this. Mm -hmm. But if it's somebody who's speaking on background, uh, this is a process that is negotiated between the reporter and the source who's giving this piece of information. Now, the source may not want to reveal the information with their name attached to it because they're too close to the situation. It would embarrass them, uh, but they feel that the story needs to be out there and that's one of the reasons why a reporter cultivates those sorts of sources. And again, it's a negotiation. It's not a one-way street. So this is, I think this is something that people need to be aware of, that the anonymous sources that you hear about are people who have chosen to go anonymous. And the reporter has agreed that this person would go on background without their name. 
And then has, this has to be cleared by somebody like uh, me. That's one of my jobs, is that I clear anonymous sourcing, um, but it's usually um, through a very lengthy process, a checklist in my mind, uh, which I have to go through to see whether these, uh, these uh, benchmarks are met before a source is allowed to speak anonymously. Uh, so there's verification, making sure that this person is who they say they are, that they actually have uh, this kind of information, uh, but it's not just, oh, someone told me. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, the, 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 the source who is providing this information can provide some sort of backup to what they are saying. Mm -hmm. um, either in terms of a record, maybe documents, uh, something which supports what they're saying, mm -hmm. but also the context. Now, the person who is making these, these uh, sometimes it's allegations, but sometimes it's just information, the person who's providing the, you this information is also in a way, in a position to know what they are saying they're giving you. You know that's another important part of this conversation, and it's it's not something that we willy nilly would allow somebody to to give that piece of information. One other thing that an anonymous source, which most news organizations will not allow to get on uh, on air or in print, is basically when they make an ad hominem attack, you know, if it is a um, something that is critical of another person where the other person does not have a chance to respond. Um, those are the kinds of things we don't like. You know, it's usually information that is critical, that needs to get out. The person is not willing to give you on, on the record, but is willing to go on background to give you. Those are the kinds of things that we vet before this information gets on air. Mm -hmm. So there are some tenets of journalism that, that journalists follow. Uh, a couple of them are truth. Mm -hmm. You know, democracy really does depend on that and our, as it, our credibility as mm -hmm. well. Verification, we've talked about that. Um, we really are the watchdogs where we hold uh, political um, people in power, you know, we hold them accountable and mm -hmm. we ask questions for the public. Uh, also inclusivity, we try to be as inclusive as we can. Now that is how it works when you're a trained journalist working in a, a traditional newsroom, but for social media sites or people with a political agenda, that's not always uh, the case because mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not following the same tenets we are. It might be you know, it, it's just not the same. Exactly. And to go back to your previous question, you said mm -hmm. that sometimes, you know, if, if the person who's not trained but is providing that information, you know, it could be an actual video of something that's happening or something that they've seen before mm -hmm. their eyes, they've actually witnessed it and they're providing that information on a platform, they are not necessarily thinking of the balance that one needs. If, if there is an accusation, particularly, against somebody, uh, we as journalists will bend over backwards to make sure that we're giving the person who's being accused of that a chance to respond. Mm. That is just, I mean, it's just out of fairness at the heart of it, uh, but it's also for legal reasons you want to make sure that the the person you're making an accusation against is getting a chance to actually give their point of view. And for us as, as journalists, there's nothing more important than trying to make sure that we are going out of our way, bending over backwards to give people enough time to respond sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and j j you know, the lay public may not realize that sometimes, but we, we take great pride and take a lot of time to do that. Mm. Yeah. I want to get to uh, one of these questions from a viewer. Um, and this this question is, why has the journalism profession shifted to using inflammatory language and denouncing ideas which the media organization disagrees with? Mm. Your thoughts? I'm not sure that's an entirely accurate way of describing it. I think most people need to differentiate between reporters um, bringing stories to the fore, mm -hmm. uh, doing the reporting, and you know, uh, publishing it, airing it, uh, you know, in television, especially with CNN being a television platform, we have reporters doing their reporting, talking to people, getting information, and commentators mm -hmm. being on panel discussions with dif differing points of view. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think sometimes viewers might mistake a commentator for being a professional journalist. Now, as the moderator, Leah, as you are right now, 
you are driving the conversation in in a in a panel discussion mm -hmm. and you will try to make sure that you get another point of view if somebody says it but as an anchor you're also pushing back against something that is you know to be false mm -hmm. and that is something which i think any trained journalist will do uh, the lay public sees it when there are panel discussions on television but in real life in news conferences, press conferences, journalists are often challenging their elected officials, holding them to account in that format. And it's not always, the lay public may not always see that, mm -hmm. but that happens on a routine basis where we are, we're challenging officials, especially if we know things are different from what they're, they're presenting. So the, the point is that I don't think it's escalated, but I think the, the use of social media mm -hmm. and people being able to use social media to get their points of view out has certainly raised the, the, the pitch in some ways. Um, I, but I would say that most professional organizations will still have a core set of values, standards and practices that they abide by, which is basically the, what I've always been talking about, which is basically to make sure that you have the other counterpoint of view and also you're reporting the facts as you know them and not opinion. Right, right. And I do think uh, in these particular contentious times, we do see a lot of opinion opinionators. We do see commentators that are mixed in with journalists. And there, that may be some of the, the reason for uh, this belief that mm -hmm. a news organization has a, you know, skews to a certain political viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I know here at GPB, mm -hmm. we cover the news. That's mm -hmm. it. And we work on a set of facts where one plus one equals two. It's never going to be one plus one equals three because I say so. And I right. sit in the White House and I say so or wherever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just one plus one equals two. And that's what we cover. We work mm -hmm. off of a basic set of facts. Mm -hmm. And that's that's all we have. We're not interested in, you know, skewing to a certain political party. That's that's not what, what right. we do. And, and I think that's what you're talking about. But I right. do think that's where the confusion comes in, exactly. where we have opinion journalism. Um, which is funny that it's called journalism because right. it's actually not. It's more thought. You right. know, it's not right. journalism right. Uh, and advocacy journalism or right. advocacy, you know, thought. Yeah. And those things you may find on your social media feed, and they typically go toward the viewpoint you already have. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And and the confusion that people have is that you know it, the traditional journalism has been just used to be just layer one facts, which mm -hmm. is basically. Uh, who, when, what, you know, why. Um, and th there was always somebody else who would present, you know, so they would quote somebody else giving you the facts. But the reporter also has an amount of expertise that they, br they can bring to bear here. And that is where I think it crosses into the next level where from just the facts you have analysis but it's built on years and years of experience in your beat. So, for instance, somebody covering the Supreme Court, uh, having seen many, many justices over the years and decades, might have more uh, of an, uh, sort of like an institutional knowledge that they can use to, to sort of give context to the story they're reporting. That's analysis. The next level is where I think most journalists are very uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. which is is, which is opinion, pure opinion. And that is something that is, uh, I think, almost any professional journalist would, would balk at because that's, A, it's not our expertise, mm -hmm. and B, it's not really productive at the end of the day. Yeah. Before we go, I have to ask you this. Uh, you know, democracy all across the world is, is being challenged in, in many countries, including ours. Journalism is is one of the very important parts of a democracy, and I want you to talk about that. Why is why is journalism so important, and why um, why do we fight so hard for it? Yeah, well, um, you know, I come from from India uh, originally. I was born in India, as you probably tell by listening to me. But um, I, which is a very large democracy. Um, and I've been in the U.S. for close to 28 years now, um, and I'm now an American citizen. And to me, I have, when I first came to this country, the thing that I was 
really struck by, I worked as a professional journalist mm -hmm. in India. The thing that struck me about this country's um, First Amendment, mm -hmm. it is the First Amendment. And the idea that you could express any thought um, it does. It doesn't matter if that if you you know if you if it was a false thought. Mm -hmm. But you have. But you have the freedom to express it, right. and that you cannot be prosecuted on the basis of just expressing a thought. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was stunning because to me, I think that's the bedrock of democracy, and the marketplace of ideas that you have people expressing their idea, their yes. their points of view. And of course, as journalists, we are not expressing our opinions, but we are we are taking very seriously this this aspect of uh, getting at the truth. Yes. All right. Thanks, Ram. Thank you. Thank you. So journalism, it happens at the global and national level, but perhaps more importantly, it happens at the local level. There are several efforts that are underway to preserve local journalism. And joining the program now to have that discussion is Donna Lowry. She's host of GPB's Lawmakers. And before that, Donna spent over three decades as a reporter and anchor in local news. Thank you, Leah and Ram. I am happy to joining me to talk about the role of local news in a democracy is pioneer journalist Jocelyn Dorsey. At WSB TV, Jocelyn became the first African-American news anchor in the Atlanta television market. She later spent more than 40 years as the director of editorials and public affairs at WSB TV. Welcome. Well, thank you, Donna. I'm excited about this conversation. So I want to start this conversation on local news with a quote from Walter Cronkite, who said, journalism is what we need to make a democracy work. And I would argue if that is true, then local news is the foundation of that, because it's where we live, it's our community, that kind of thing. How would, how would you respond to that? Absolutely. But before we go there, I want to let people know that uh, this is a topic that I had to research, because everybody assumes that we're experts in everything. We but... just do it. <laughs> and I wanted, for full transparency, because we talk about sources, I wanted to at least talk about where I got my information, because it's a tremendous piece. And that was from the University of North Carolina and the Hussman School of Journalism and Media. It did over 100, maybe almost 200 pages of research of what this was all about, and I certainly learned a lot, although, you know, there were some things that I suspected and I knew, but this certainly confirmed the information that I'm about to disseminate to everybody. So, and forgive my notes, because I want to be accurate, and um, there's some real details in here that I would like people to know. Um, but when you talk about local news, um, think about it. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, what do you say? How are my kids going to school? What's the weather going to be like? Is the traffic going to be bad? Um, and those are things that you normally don't have to worry about, at least in the metropolitan Atlanta area, because you have local journalists to tell you how to do it. There are people who are doing things all across the country and very creative things. I'll give you a couple of examples. In New Jersey, journalists have created a map to help families find meals. In North Carolina, journalists and community organizers created a phone tree to help people check on their neighbors. In Detroit, reporters are texting safety information for people who don't have wireless access. And the, and the list goes on and on. But you must understand during COVID, a lot of people talk talk about first responders that have, and essential workers that have lost their jobs, journalists have lost their jobs as well. There's like 36,000 journalists who have lost their jobs across the country. And I thought that, you know, that may be something that people need to know. And 30 states have determined that journalists are essential workers. So when you look at, you know, what's happening across our country, and this was happening in addition to what's been happening historically, um, and so, despite the efforts of other media, I'm going to talk about newspapers primarily because 85% of the information that we get comes from newspapers. Um, but television is trying to make up the void, uh, but they really can't do that. And social media is also trying to make up the void. And so, um, while they try that and the best that they can, Television viewers have also declined. And when you look at what's happening across the country, um, why is this? And why have newspapers fallen by the wayside? The interesting fact that I found 
I, I should ask you, why do you think? Okay. Take a guess. Why, why have newspapers? newspapers. It, it has to do with advertising dollars. Craigslist. That's it. Craigslist. Craigslist. Can it's you believe it? Right. People classifieds. Read classifieds. People don't realize that classified ads were the way that newspapers derived most of their revenue. And Craigslist, there was a study done between the years of 2000 and 2007 that Craigslist cost newspapers five billion dollars in advertising. So when you look at that, and it's still, if you look at, they're saying that if you look at within 10 percent likelier that a newspaper will fold if Craigslist is is within 30 miles of that location. So isn't that fascinating that, you know, this is what has changed the landscape. And then you have to take in, into the fact that news has also declined on television, but guess what? Television gets most of their news from newspapers. I mean, you know, I know people don't want us to admit that, but, but they absolutely do. And so to look at what's happening in radio and all of those areas are declining that, you know, the real value of real news we're losing. Yeah, and I, I would contend at the local level that the newspapers are your connection to your community. It is your connection to your neighbors. It's your connection to your schools. It's your, it's, it's knowing about what's going on just right in your neighborhood first. And without that local news, you don't, you don't get any of that. I've always loved little small pl- papers, like when we were growing up, where we'd be able to see our names and our pictures in there. You know, I was a candy striper, and I was in the newspaper, and that was a big deal. Um, and I think the the sad part is people have lost a lot of that. When when news goes away at the local level, you lose that. And it's so funny you mentioned that because those were exactly the things that I was going to mention. The one big thing, though, is that, you know, the newspapers in the past 15 years, 50 percent of the audience is gone from newspapers. And even of the 6,700 newspapers left, they're a shell of what they were before. I'm going to talk a lot about the Atlanta Journal-Constitution because initially in this uh, research, I found that there was a lot of reference to the Journal-Constitution. Um, but, you know, the bad part is that we probably won't ever go back to where we were in newspapers. So we're going to have to look at how things have changed and what are we going to do to accommodate local news. Because is in the absence of local news, what you are having is what uh, the previous conversation was about, and that's fake news. You get the social media, you know, viral viral news goes faster, 10 times faster than real news. And that's the danger that, you know, we're going to, we're already becoming a polarized society. And with news now as fake news, and we're not being able to determine it, and not having that local voice, I think we're going to be polarized even more. Yeah, we you, you talked a little bit about the coronavirus early on, though, in the coronavirus, when we all shut down, it was the local news that people had to rely on. You didn't know what was going on with your neighbors. It was, it, you know, it's thinking back on it was kind of a surreal time. We were all in our homes and the only thing we had to reach out to was the newspaper or what was on television to know what was going on. So that's the irony of what w- went on with the pandemic. Of course, as things started open, un- opening up, uh, we realized that newspapers, we newspapers and television lost advertising dollars. Uh, we've seen layoffs, we've seen furloughs uh, and, and salary cuts in the news business, and that they, they've just um, gone by the wayside. And I, do you think the average person recognizes the fact of what they what, recognizes what they've lost in local news over uh, the last few years, even not just this. This the right. coronavirus right. proved to um, be the end for a lot of places, right. but it's it's, it's devastating. Been declining. I mean, it, people may not realize the impact because some of it is so subtle. I mean, we talk about the fact that you know we're not going to see the high school football scores, and we're not going to see you know uh, who was in the play obituaries, marriages. I mean, really, the local news operations were the ones that kept the public record of a city, of a community. And that's what's lost is, you know, you don't have reporters sitting in courtrooms and listening to judges and you don't have them, you know, phoning in police beats. And you just keep going down the line, you know, who's looking after the nursing homes? Who's looking after the police? And, and those things are so important in local communities that people are missing that. But the, and the other thing too is when you look at political candidates, 
and and you look at who's running in these local races because most of the even television can't cover all the local races that are going on it's those local newspapers and those local outlets that give you the information so you can decide on who to vote for um, and and that's one of the things that I think's important and what we have are a lot of news deserts what they're talking about and in some and and so you know, they're not covering the school boards. They're not covering any of this. And so what happens is you get people who are crooked and who are so glad that there is no reporting of local news. And then you, and, and that feeds into corruption. So, you know, subtly what will happen is you'll have corruption taking place. And there's an interesting study. I have to tell you this because I thought this was, um, this was very important. Economists at the University of Chicago and Notre Dame have shown that even the cost of municipal borrowing increases significantly when local newspapers shut down. According to their survey of 1,596 English language newspapers, serving some 1,266 counties at some point between 1996 and 2015. Whenever a local newspaper closed or reduced publishing to fewer than four days a week or was absorbed by another news outlet, municipal borrowing rates, that is the cost of municipal bonds, increased within three years by five to 11 point basis. And that's a significant rise in municipal bonds. They found that in 30, 300 instances in which newspapers merged, downsized, or died, it led to substantially higher, higher borrowing costs. And then newspapers also affect a city's payroll. A lot of people don't realize that. The median county saw its total government wages raised by $1.4 million a year after a local newspaper closed. Not only did the number of government employees increase, individual taxpayer bills rose on an average of $85 a year, and local governments appeared to be less efficient. They increased their employee base. I mean, the list could go on and on and on. And most of this is because there's no watchdog. Exactly. Wow. Because that is the mission of local news, is to be a watchdog for the government. Mm. And when you don't have that, um, and you find that, you know, the social media may take it up, but it's really just a blip in the radar. It's not the resources that they have to have reporters who are actually sitting in all of these sessions and listening and digging. Um, and then there's one other thing that I thought was interesting, and uh, we'll go to that later, but um, talking about the, the role of newspapers, especially the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. A lot of people don't realize the Constitution, well, the Atlanta Journal and Constitution were two separate newspapers right. until 2001. The oh, Constitution okay. was a morning and the Journal was I didn't was realize a, it had been that long, actually. Yeah, it seems like yeah. it was just yesterday. We had I know. Time. Well, I've been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Constitution was a morning paper and it was a bit more liberal and the, right. the Journal was a bit more conservative. And it was one of the first, the Constitution was one of the first Southern newspapers to really report the civil rights movement in a very objective way. The newsrooms um, were operating separately, but this attracted the attention of the nation when the AJC was reporting what was going on in the civil rights movement, and they won Pulitzer Prizes after Pulitzer Prizes for what was going on and shaped the debate. When you think about it, they shaped the debate of the politics of the South and made an impact and a difference in ways that we will never know. Well, we do know, and we can certainly appreciate. But now, look at it this way. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution in 1996 circulated in 124 counties of the 159 counties in Georgia. Wow. Now it's only 32 counties. And I want to get to the, some more of those news de deserts because we, ha we have something we're going to show up the screen from that, that the University of North Carolina's Hussman School of Journalism, where they, they talk about the news deserts and they looked at Georgia and drilled down on things. And that map shows that of Georgia's 159 counties, 28 of them 
don't have a newspaper, right. and 112 of them only have a single newspaper. And that's a decrease of 21 percent between 2004 and 2019. So this isn't new, right. but it is continuing to happen. And coronavirus kind of just shut it down for a lot of places. And the impact can be dramatic. One of the recent stories that I think will surprise people, well, that won't surprise people perhaps if they think about it, but it was the Brunswick News wrote this article in May of 2020, and the, it was the Pointer Institute's media critic, Tom Jones, who really brought this to the forefront of the glaring, you know, uh, desert, the news desert and what could happen in a news desert. And that was why did it take so long for Ahmad Aubrey and the shooting in Brunswick, Georgia, to surface to the national level. Think about that. Right. It was it was months. One of the reasons was that, you know, it was reported in the local Brunswick paper, but nobody picked it up. Right. And it wasn't until the Atlanta Journal Constitution picked it up. Jacksonville was closer. Atlanta AJC is 300 miles away from Brunswick. The only thing, you know, one of the things that they cover, and they don't have a bureau, and so what they really only cover is weather and climate conditions. And so uh, the Jacksonville papers and TV stations, which are closer, didn't pick it up. So it wasn't until the AJC picked it up and subsequently the New York Times picked it up that it became a national story. The Brunswick reporter said that the biggest thing that helped that story was the fact that the AJC and New York Times had reporters who could deal, who could dig deep into the story and they had the resources to really get to the surface of what was going on. And the Brunswick, Brunswick only had four reporters for the whole paper. So they couldn't expend the resources to really do the digging that was needed for that case. And Brunswick had a newspaper, where, and we're talking about all the, the deserts of news that don't have anything like that, and that you have journalists who were trained to understand to do that, to, what, to know what to do at the AJC and the New York Times. It's amazing to think about that. We, we've got to talk about something hopeful before all of this <laughs> is over. We've talked about the consequences. We've talked about limited access to local news and all, but are there some solutions? Are there some alternatives, something we can feel good about? Please. <laughs> yes, yes, there absolutely are. One of the things we'll talk about, the politics. The UNC, I couldn't even go into the political aspects of what's going on in local news and how many bills there are in Congress. The UNC has a list of all those bills that are pending in Congress and ideas that are pending before the FCC about what to do about local news. Um, but they're hoping that Congress's newfound um, discovery of what's happened in light of COVID is going to really help uh, give support to local news organizations. Um, the hope is that, you know, it could happen, but this is an election year, and so nothing may happen until January. One of the interesting things is, though, that news advocates are also saying that um, we need to look at public broadcasting and the fact that very little public broadcasting is devoted to covering local news. And so they want that paradigm to shift. So that's another thing that people we, we are We want about. that to happen. And we could go on and on about this. <laughs> we thought this segment, we, we weren't gonna have enough to talk about. There was so much to talk about. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, Absolutely. for talking. Look, digging into all of that and being who you are, your insight tonight, your contributions to journalism. We appreciate you too. Well, thank so, you. We will now continue the conversation on democracy and the informed citizen with Virginia Prescott. Now, Virginia is the award-winning host of On Second Thought on GPB and has been a past host on the popular podcast, Civics 101. Virginia? Thank you, Donna. Douglas Blackman is with me. He's professor of practice in Georgia State University's Creative Media Industries Institute. He was a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Atlanta bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal, and host and executive producer of the American Forum on PBS stations. 
Blackman won the Pulitzer Prize for his book Slavery by Another Name. A film adaptation premiered at the Sundance Film Festival before making its television premiere on PBS in 2012. He has made a career of surfacing stories that promote empathy, understanding, and dialogue, values at the very heart of the humanities. And we're lucky to have him with us tonight to talk about how good journalism supports informed decisions and civil discourse. Well, Doug, I saw you nodding along during the conversation many times, so I hope we get to a lot of things. But I'm going to start with a little bit of a big picture. Media consumption has been way up during COVID, but also at the same time, we're looking at polls from Pew and from Pointer and Knight, and they say that public confidence in the media has never been so low. So this is, this is a time when the media is being blamed for divisions, exacerbating divisions in our country. Is that a fair criticism? No, it's not, really. Uh, the, there certainly are things about our media and the way the media operates today and some of the, the problems that have developed in recent years that you've already heard some about tonight. Uh, those are real things. The, the economic crisis of newspapers and other news organizations, that's a very real thing, has had a profound impact. But the reality is that media is a mirror of its, of its viewers and readers and its audience. And, the, and because media, generally speaking, except for public uh, broadcasting, uh, media, the, the, when we say that word, what we're talking about are businesses uh, that, are, that are constantly evolving to try to provide answers to the questions that their audience has. Uh, and so what the media is focused on tends to be a real reflection of, of what the people are most interested in. And, uh, and the, as I said, there, there are certainly lots of uh, mistakes that happen along the way, but, but I, I think there's a, a tendency to overblame uh, the, the voices in the media for some of the things we're frustrated about now, the polarization we're frustrated with right now, uh, when in reality, uh, there's, a, there's a burden of thoughtfulness on the part of the people uh, that I think not enough people take seriously. Well, there seems to be an overhang when we're talking about criticizing the media, that there was a golden age of facts when newspapers and news organizations reliably gave society information about facts and helped them make good decisions. Is that historically accurate? It's really not. Uh, and you could debate that point. But the, the truth is, if you look at the history of American newspapers, that, uh, and, and once you get past the 1960s, it's all newspapers, or uh, you know, it's, it's not until then that radio and television become major purveyors of the news, and now the, the internet as we know it. Uh, but if you go back in time, newspapers were crucial to the, uh, to the function of our democracy and the way that information was exchanged. But this notion of total objectivity, which is kind of impossible uh, for anyone to, to, to accomplish, the whole purpose of the media in a way is to be somewhat subjective, is to screen through everything that's happening at any given time and identify those things that seem to be most important or of greatest interest to the audience that that, that organization has. And up until the 1950s, really, uh, newspapers, were uh, were much more politically oriented. They tended to reflect the the viewpoints of the the family that owned them. That was the case uh, here in Atlanta with the, the the differences between the Constitution and the Atlanta Journal. Um, the and the, it's not until the 1960s that uh, when television news really comes into its own and we begin to have the nightly news that's available in every place, every night, and voices like Walter Cronkite uh, that, that represent a, a kind of collective uh, uh, um, approach to facts and that everybody is seeing the same thing at the same time. Uh, and that's when the, the real appreciation of this, this more objective way of approaching the news begins to take hold, but it hasn't been all that long. You know? And so it's not totally surprising that, uh, that in the current age, when those local media outlets uh, have been eclipsed by, by people and their self, the cameras on their cell phones and by next door and all, all of the just endless numbers of, of super, mi super micro local uh, ways of getting information, uh, that it's no surprise that that's all bubbling up in a way uh, that doesn't have some of the rules that Rom was talking about earlier in the show uh, and, that, and that we then end up being very frustrated about, uh, about some of the things that we see. So we don't have those gatekeepers anymore, and we have a lot of fractured news organizations coming from a lot of different directions. And not only that, but 
information that is incentivized to be the most bombastic, which is often not factual. So we've got a number of questions from viewers here asking pretty much about the role of the citizen and some tools that citizens can use that you share with your students and you share with others to help discern what is the factual news from the quote unquote fake news. Well, the one thing I would emphasize to anyone and that I frequently do is that, you know, we have been, human beings have been figuring out who to trust and who not to trust for as long as there has been language. Uh, and, and long before media was uh, existed in any form, human beings uh, became very good uh, at identifying what was plausible and who could be trusted. Uh, today, uh, I think we have too many uh, people who uh, have stopped using those fundamental internal skills that are almost genetically hardwired into us. And the, the key thing to having news consumers and just good citizens who are able to sort through these complicated things effectively, the single most important part of that is for people to start off with a presumption that their neighbors and that their local leaders and that, that the people they know are not monsters. <laughs> and that and if somebody comes along and says, your neighbor is a monster, uh, then that's something to be suspicious of. Uh, and if your neighbor is a monster, you do want to know that. You want to figure that out. But you want to do what, what these news organizations have, have tried to do over time, is that you, you want to look into this a little further. What's really the evidence of this? I'm not going to just leap to an assumption uh, that that somebody that I am not sure about for some other reason must be lying. And an important thing to remember about all that is that there's another moment in history that we can remember, and that is the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, and it's this fascinating moment in time where you had someone elected president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, who was not saying he was going to bring an end to the institution of slavery. Thank goodness that ultimately happened. But that's not what Abraham Lincoln was saying. But people in the South uh, who wanted the institution of slavery to continue became convinced that no matter what he said, that's what he meant, that he was going to destroy the system that on which the, the southern states based their whole world. And so people ultimately went to war, triggered this terrible conflict that cost more American lives than any other con conflict in our history uh, on the basis of a claim that a newly elected president was trying to do something that he had never said he was attempting to do. And so we, we've got to get out of that cycle, that cycle of presumption of venality on the part of people that we think we have some sort of disagreement with. Well, there's been studies at Emory, I think it was in 2006, that looked at how the brain responds to information. And if you see something that supports your candidate as being, you know, upstanding, you believe that, but you were you have a really difficult time believing that your candidate is being a hypocrite. You know, the brain actually lights up. The, the, the pleasure center that also responds to addiction lights up. You get a dopamine hit when you think the other guy is wrong. So you're fighting against biology and you're fighting against culture, never mind Russian bots at this particular juncture in time. How, you know, beyond feeling the, the or trusting others, what are some of the tools that you use to figure out what looks like fake news? Well, this would apply to fake news. I think it applies to a lot of things in life, a lot of judgments in life. And that is to think of people uh, and, the, and the characters that you see in a story that you see on television or that you hear about in a podcast or on the radio or that you hear your neighbor talking about. That, that when people begin to tell stories, and that's basically all we ever do in the course of a human life is tell stories to other people. Uh, but when you begin to hear these stories, approach them, again, relying on what you already know about human beings and humanity and the likelihood that people are well-intentioned, even if they're wrong, but also to view people as human beings, as multi-dimensional human beings. And that is a part of, of all of the kind of work that I've tried to do uh, in newspapers and in you know writing books and making films, uh, is this idea that if I'm gonna tell the story of a young African-American man who's been done wrong in some way by the criminal justice system or by, the, by other people in his community, that needs to be a, the story of a person you know, who has dimensionality to their, to their life. Uh, the, I need to have some understanding and my audience needs to see who are the parents of this person? Who was this person in love with? What was the song that he liked to, 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 to hear the most often? And it's only then when we really recognize the humanity 
the humanity, it's through the humanities, that's when we can really see the importance and the precious, preciousness uh, of these things. And that forces us to be more serious about figuring out, is, the, is this a monster or is this other party a monster? Uh, or is it something that has happened just a misunderstanding? But we, but we have to restore in our society uh, the, the impulse towards seeing the humanity in our fellow citizens. Right. That doesn't communicate necessarily in a meme very well. No. Well, there's another listener question here about you. You know, we're talking about consumers, but also for reporters. Does news media have a responsibility to report facts with a neutral tone and without editorialization? And I think what you know, inside of journalism circles, there are people now who are saying we should not pretend to be without bias. We should just be upfront with who we are and the fact is that nobody can be absolutely free of bias. Everything is subjective, and, and I want to see where you were with that. Over the years that I hired reporters to the Wall Street Journal and managed uh, people who were writing thousands of, uh, of stories over time and the, my own work, uh, the, the thing that I have always emphasized was not so much objectivity, with this, which I think is kind of impossible and really not the point of, uh, of, the, of the thing that we were doing, but the word equity, fairness. Uh, and I think we've also heard about that um, uh, earlier in the discussion tonight, too. And that is that if there's evidence that the president cheated on his taxes, uh, then that's information that should be offered up to the American people to let them consider the, uh, the, the credibility of that information. But also, there needs to be uh, great effort made to try to represent what the president uh, has to say about those things. And where professional journalism becomes so important is that if the president or whoever the subject of some allegation like this might be, if they fail to represent themselves, if they fail to, to tell the other side of the story that perhaps would make it look differently, well, journalists do have an obligation to actually do that for them uh, to, to as best we can, uh, because that is part of the, the professional task of, of bringing to every story, every communication with our audiences is to say, yes, we're trying to do this in the most equitable way possible. Now, I will say, it's also true that if we were back in 1865 and I'm a journalist and I somehow become aware that John Wilkes Booth is on his way to Ford's Theater planning to, to assassinate the president of the United States, um, the, the burden of, of equity and fairness to John Wilkes Booth begins to decline rapidly. Uh, there are times that uh, that that our nation is in national crisis and that uh, and that journalists roles do begin to change in certain ways. I think we're in something of a national crisis today. I don't say that pointing in a precise political direction, but I think that uh, these are days in which uh, all people need to think very seriously about the events that are occurring and the future of the country and how we can, uh, the roles that we should all play in that. But for journalists, there's still a dimension of equity that has to be brought, even when they are making a decision that, that uh, we have to say things and do things perhaps in ways that are somewhat different uh, from the past because the scale of the issues are bigger at the time uh, and demand that. Yeah, well, we're looking at, uh, th these are some of the fundamentals of our democracy, the idea that access to and, and widely spread access to good, solid information will help us make good decisions. But also, information helps us to negotiate. It helps us to compromise. These are the absolute engines of democracy. So you said we're at a point of national crisis. What does this mean for our democracy at this moment? Well, I think that we, we have to find a way uh, to where Americans uh, largely, uh, whatever our race or background or political inclinations may be, but we have to find our way back to some some one page, some one place where there are where we're all willing to accept that we still have some common values, uh, such as a, a real insistence on telling the truth. You know, I mean, that's a really basic thing uh, and, a, and, a, and something that Americans uh, in the past that was almost a kind of cult of truth telling in American life. And that the one, the most unacceptable thing uh, would be a leader, someone who positioned themselves as a leader, but who then turned out to be untrustworthy uh, and willing to tell, tell us things that were false. And the, and so, but we have to find our way back to some basic Set of values that that are shared across a political spectrum. In the past, what has tended to unify Americans more than anything else have been enemies, 
clear enemies. And so during the Cold War, uh, there, was a, there was a demand on all citizens that, uh, to, to recognize the danger of, the, of this, the, this enemy out in the world, of the Soviet Union or communism or however, however one wants to describe it. But, and, and, that, and that forced our system and ourselves uh, to acknowledge that, okay, we need to show some respect for the presidency. Uh, we need to, uh, we can't undermine every single thing that the government does at all times, because at some point we need to be able to rely on these institutions. We need to be able to demand honesty from, from our leaders because there are bad things that could happen if we don't. Now we're in a time that, thank goodness, our kids don't have to, you know, learn how to get ready for an atomic war uh, as we once did, and that you know th those kinds of dangers don't seem to be uh, as important uh, in, in our lives. But the but in the absence of that, we've entered a period of time in which Americans just don't take these things very seriously. You know, things like presidential elections, I think people, uh, many many people, tend to see them as kind of a funny thing. You know, it's, it's sort of like a baseball game, uh, and I, I want my team to win, and I'm going to get really passionate about it. I'm going to insist that my team is the best, even though I'm, whether there's any basis for that or not. And we've got to get past that and get back to a place uh, where we take, uh, we, we take our system and our values more seriously. Douglas Blackman, I want to thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Douglas Blackman, he is GSU professor and Pulitzer Prize winning author of Slavery by Another Name. On behalf of GPB and my colleagues, Leah Fleming and Donna Lowry, thank you so much to Ram Ram Gopal and to Jocelyn Dorsey and to Douglas Blackman for joining us this evening. We are grateful to the Georgia Humanities Council for putting this event together with GPB, and you can visit georgiahumanities.org for resources, including a media literacy guidebook and other tools. We want to thank all of you for being part of these critical conversations on democracy and the informed citizens. Be safe, be well, and talk to your neighbors. Good night. GPB this fall for a virtual speaker series with NPR reporters and correspondents from around the country. These conversations will be an opportunity for in-depth analysis of some of the issues facing communities across the U.S. and right here in Georgia. Visit www.gpb.org community for more information.